on this episode of the End of Tourism podcast. We've had a capitalist system for maybe 500 or 600 years. It seems like a long time in terms of our own lifetime, but in the whole scheme of things, it's quite a short period of time. And it's very then possible to imagine that a thousand years in the future, people will look back at capitalism as a small blip in the evolution of a human society rather than this uh, kind of hegemonic and ingrained structure that, that we consider it uh, to be. So that's you know, exactly how ideology works, is by making it seem that it's impossible to imagine uh, things otherwise. And then, of course, always the way to start breaking that down is to start seeing it in this long-term perspective, in this historical perspective, as a culturally specific kind of moment, as a contingent system that we've created and can potentially decide uh, to do otherwise. Welcome to the end of tourism, a podcast about wanderlust, exile, and radical hospitality. For some, tourism can entail learning, freedom, or financial survival. For others, it means the loss of culture, land, and lineage. Our conversations explore the unauthorized histories and consequences of modern travel. They are dispatches from the resistance. On this episode, our guest is Robert Fletcher, an environmental anthropologist and author at Wageningen University in the Netherlands. He is based there in the Sociology of Development and Change Group. A former ecotourism guide himself, Robert carries research interests such as conservation, development, tourism, globalization, climate change, human to wildlife interaction, social and resistance movements, and non-state forms of governance. His publications include the books The Conservation Revolution, Radical Ideas for Saving Nature Beyond the Anthropocene, and Romancing the Wild, Cultural Dimensions of Ecotourism. Welcome to the End of Tourism podcast, Robert. Thank you. It's nice to be here. Would you uh, do us the honor of telling us where you find yourself today, both in time and place? Well, I'm living in Amsterdam in the Netherlands right now, and I work as an associate professor at a university here called Wageningen University uh, in a department called the Sociology of Development and Change. Wow. Thank you for that. So in your essay, Ecotourism Discourse, Challenging the Stakeholders' Theory, you talk about how, it seems to me anyways, how you went undercover to study the effects of ecotourism in South America. Why has this become your field of study? Uh, first, I should uh, probably say I didn't go undercover <laughs> uh, because that's technically a no-no uh, in my field in anthropology. Right. Um, I let people know that I was doing research, but of course, the things that I found you know, weren't necessarily what I expected to find or what people always wanted me to find. But I first got started uh, studying ecotourism uh, as a traveler myself. Right after university, I did a long um, trip uh, throughout uh, Central America. Like many people I knew, it was definitely a thing to do at the time. For a while, I worked as an ecotour guide myself, as a whitewater rafting guide uh, in Costa Rica. Uh, And then I decided to branch off from there, put on my backpack, uh, and went traveling around. And over time, you know, I found myself reflecting on what I'd done Um, the positives uh, and the negatives, uh, and really kind of asking myself, you know, first off, what my motivation was for doing what I did, but also what the impacts were of my travel. And that led me to start, you know, thinking about travel as a serious academic subject. And of course, then I discovered that a lot of people had already done this as well. And there was a lot of really interesting research reflecting on these experiences. And I got deeper into that and started thinking of my own contribution to this discussion. Mm, Thank you for that, Robert. And so, Ecotourism generally claims to be a remedy for conventional tourism. How might we as tourists, travelers, and everyday people see it instead as an extension of conventional tourism? I think a lot of it has to do with the the scale, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, And and the way it's practiced. Um, A lot of times, uh, you know, conventional tourists and ecotourists, even though ecotourists claim to be doing things differently, have very uh, similar motivations. Mm. Uh, One of the things you notice most about uh, ecotourists is the way it's very important to them to distinguish themselves from mass tourists and claim that what they're doing uh, is different, right? 
Uh, but what we also find is, is that's true of most tourists. In fact, one of the uh, very first kind of analyses of tourism claim that that is essentially what defines a tourist uh, is the desire not to be a tourist and to want to be different than other tourists, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so ecotourists, you know, definitely uh, have that kind of strong uh, motivation to be different. Essentially, that motivation to be different is kind of what makes them the same, which is quite interesting. On the other hand, uh, the impacts of uh, ecotourism uh, can be quite different, right? And the motivation can be different, and the way it's practiced and the impact it has on local communities uh, can be quite different, right? Uh, as long as it's done in a particular way. If it's done in kind of a large-scale way, with an attempt to try to save as much money as possible to move quickly uh, between different places, then ecotourism doesn't necessarily have a greater you know, positive impact uh, on places than, than mass tourism. But if um, ecotourism is done in a small scale basis, is actually managed by local people, if most of the revenue is captured by local people, if tourists actually then are willing to pay more for you know, services that then provide benefit to communities, and if they have a genuine influence, interest in spending more time uh, and getting to know people in local communities, uh, then I think it can, in the right circumstances, be quite different. Hmm. I'd like to ask you about extinction tourism. Uh-huh. In your essay, Contradictions in Tourism, Robert, you speak of a new type of tourism that aligns with the deep awareness and consequences of climate change, which we call extinction tourism. Would you be willing to tell our listeners what extinction tourism is and what might be some of its contradictions? Mm hmm. Yeah, extinction tourism uh, is essentially the phenomenon of traveling to places precisely because they are unlikely to exist in the future. Mm-hmm. Right, so classic examples are going to visit species that are endangered right, with the potential that they won't be around in the future, to visit uh, things like glaciers uh, that are in the process of disappearing. Okay? Mm-hmm. So essentially that. And what's interesting about it is it kind of shifts the focus of a lot of what was considered nature-based tourism in the past, right? Things like ecotourism essentially are trying to sell an experience of encounter with nature. What extinction tourism does is sell an encounter with the disappearance of nature. Wow. So it's a bit different. But what is interesting is it is precisely response to the economic uh, and ecological crisis uh, that we've been experiencing, right? As places start to disappear... You know, tourism has always been a sense about commodifying uh, places and spaces, and that's one of the things that ecotourism also does, commodifying nature. And when the nature disappears, then you potentially lose the basis uh, for the commodification uh, and the value it creates. But so what you can instead do through things like ecotourism is shift that source of value from the nature itself to the disappearance of nature. And so you can capitalize on the disappearance of a resource, on the degradation of a resource, rather than its uh, preservation. And of course, that that makes it uh, quite contradictory, right? In all yeah, kinds of immediately uh, the, the notion comes to mind of the fetishization of disappearance. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the more I think about it, the more it seems to be not so much a surprise, but I guess in the end, a, an extension, a growth, an outgrowth of what tourism already is mm-hmm. through the museum experience and uh, zoos, as you said, you know, endangered species. Yeah, the way I like to think of tourism is, in a sense, it's a capitalism as its most creative, kind of pushing wow. the frontier of what you can create value from. Right? And also then taking things that are essentially problems that, you know, previous forms of capitalist development have created and actually transforming them into new sources of value, right? It's a dynamic that we call a disaster capitalism. Um, so capitalism creates poverty, and then you can create tourism experiences around going to slums, right? Mm. Uh, capitalism creates uh, inequality that causes people to migrate, you know, for instance, trying to uh, migrate from Mexico to the United States. And then you can create a, a form of tourism around providing a fake experience of trying to travel illicitly from uh, Mexico uh, to the United States. And there's a theme park that actually exists uh, that provides that experience, right? So taking problems that are created by capitalism and using it as the basis for new tourism experiences, that's one of the things that that, uh, tourism does uh, really well. And extinction uh, tourism is one form of this. Wow. (laughs) Wow. I have a quote here from one of your essays, but you quote Stephen Leahy, who wrote, tourism companies are now using climate change as a marketing tool. Right. And that quote, I should note, is from 2008, Mm. from 13 years ago. 
So even if most of our listeners haven't heard of extinction tourism, that this has been around for a long time, it seems anyways. So the idea of a global village or one world, or the idea of a singular humanity contributes to the notion that the Anthropocene is not just every culture's problem and responsibility, but that every culture uniformly has played a part in that damage of, of this extinction level event. Do you agree with this? And if not, what are the consequences for this kind of thinking? Yeah, I definitely don't agree with that. And I think that's one of the dangers you know, that's been pointed out about the Anthropocene concept. It seems to create a image of a homogenous humanity, a homogenous set of people that have all contributed equally uh, to the environmental impacts uh, that we're experiencing. And that's definitely not the case, right? For the last several hundred years, at least, it's been a very, very small group of people that's very disproportionately caused the environmental impacts that we experience, and very much because they drive and are caught up within this very particular economic system, uh, capitalism, that's only really existed as a global force for the last four or 500 years. So some people have even argued that rather than calling our current era the Anthropocene, we should really call it the Capitalocene to emphasize that. And that really shifts the focus, right? It shifts the focus away from this idea that humans are just naturally kind of ravenous of resources and use resources unsustainably to arguing that it's no particular people caught up in particular political, uh, economic, and cultural circumstances. And that means um, a different focus on how we can intervene in the situation, right? That if we can change those political uh, and cultural uh, circumstances, then maybe we can influence things uh, quite a bit. Otherwise, if you just argue that humans, by definition, use resources unsustainably, then essentially your only recourse is to think about population growth and curbing that as a way to deal with the crisis. Uh, And that gets us into some very uh, dangerous uh, territory that I think is best avoided. And so if people are traveling and touring during what many consider to be the Earth's sixth major extinction level event, how do you think we might turn that spectacle into kind of real and enduring grief work or mourning, right? Or maybe the question is not only how, but where we might do that. So much of what appears to exist below the surface of extinction tourism is a desire to not just see disappearing things, but perhaps to contend with the fact that we've contributed to this at present and ancestrally. Mm -hmm. So do you think there's a way either through travel and tourism or or otherwise, that we might contend with this in a better way? Yeah, I definitely think there is. And I think the first thing that any potential traveler needs to do uh, is first start to reflect deeply and ask themselves what they're traveling for, mm-hmm. what they're um, trying to get to, but also what they're they're trying to leave behind. Because I think it's quite clear uh, that a lot of travel is motivated you know, by this need to escape conditions of life that are considered dissatisfying or unsustainable, right? Mm. Uh, But of course, if you try to escape from these things, then you come back to them again, right? Uh, Then it's not really a sustainable model, right? So I think it's uh, first and foremost important to think about whether it's possible to live in a different way and to shape uh, the circumstances of your life such that you don't feel this need to have to escape them from time to time by going off and doing uh, these other excursions. Right. And so minimizing uh, the need to actually have to travel, to take holidays, I think is the first thing that travelers uh, should reflect on, which isn't to say that, you know, after doing this reflection, that we shouldn't travel at all, right? There can be very valuable gains from traveling, both personally, but also in terms of the connections that are developed, the mutual understanding that's developed between different places, and also then the exchange of resources, right? But I think it's first important to reflect on your motivation for travel uh, and whether you're doing it uh, for the right reasons, and then to think about uh, how you can structure your travel in such a way that it maximizes the benefits and minimizes uh, the negatives. And to do that, it's really important to be informed, right? Because we know a lot about how travel works, We know a lot about its impacts in different places, environmentally, socially, uh, and economically. And we know a lot about then what forms of travel tend to deliver the most benefits um, relative uh, to the downside. Uh, So educating yourself about all of this uh, and then trying to use this as a basis uh, to structure your travel in the best way, I think, is one of the most important things uh, that we can do. 
in terms of Thank this you. question of using travel as a way to deal with grief, I mean, that's another uh, interesting issue. One of the things I find fascinating about things like extinction tourism uh, is the sense that there's a need to directly witness things, right, mm. as the basis for making change. Uh, and I wonder about that, right? Because mm. we know about all of these impacts. We know the glaciers are disappearing. We know species are disappearing, right? And is it really necessary then uh, to go and experience these places directly uh, to be able to access, you know, the, those emotions that are associated with it uh, in the sense of, of needing to change? Why is it so important uh, to have these same kind of visceral experiences? There's a lot of interesting analogies to this in tourism in general, all these um, kind of trips to go and see a place, for instance, that's been depicted in a movie, uh, to see a historical site where nothing exists, but you know something existed in the past, right? It's interesting thing to, to actually have a direct experience of something, you know, that, that you've, you've actually experienced before, but somehow uh, being right there makes it more real. But I wonder if it's not possible then to you know, try to develop those same kind of reflections, those same types of experiences at a distance and not have the need to actually travel to a place, right? Where you enter up into these kind of uh, contradictions, right? For instance, if you travel, you know, by plane uh, to see a glacier that's disappearing, to see an island that's disappearing, then of course you're contributing to the disappearance of the various things that you're trying to visit, right? And so even if you gain awareness through that, even if you use that as a basis to change your lifestyle, it can be argued that the, the travel itself was probably not uh, an overall benefit. Mm. Wow. Wow. So much to contend with, so much to unpack there. Thank you, Robert. I'd like to ask a, a few questions on the transformations that occur within ecotourism communities and all people really that are involved. What do you think happens as a result of ecotourism to the people involved, both local and foreign, when nature is presumed to be more important than the human realm? Mm, that's really interesting. I don't think I've ever reflected on that directly. In terms of the social impacts of ecotourism, I mean, one of the things that always, that always tends to happen uh, in communities is a sense of people starting to look back on their own ways of life uh, from the perspective of outsiders, right? Which changes the perspective. Mm. And then starting to reflect on what aspects are considered valuable by outsiders and, and what aren't, right? And what side then potentially can be uh, transformed into sources of value, right? And there's some really interesting research that documents the way in which this can change local people's relationship to their you know, cultural traditions, to sacred spaces, right? The transformation of sacred spaces when they realize that these are places that tourists want to access so that they become more important as sources of revenue than as sacred spaces. All of these uh, things can very much change local people's relations with their local environment. But one thing I can comment on then is my research has shown about the types of environments that especially eager tourists are looking for. Uh, and how this influences uh, local people's ability uh, to actually engage in ecotourism. Right? What I found a lot, you know, is yeah, essentially what ecotourists are looking to try to do is to escape um, the human realm, right? And to find this uh, realm of nature, right? To get away from culture, uh, to move into the realm of nature uh, and to try to escape people into this uh, imagined realm of wilderness as much as possible. Right? And so what this requires then is uh, the creating of these spaces that are free of people, and reserved for uh, non-human nature. Now, um, most of the time, right, especially in rural communities in the global south, these spaces don't exist in and of themselves because people are using spaces for livelihoods. Mm. Uh, and so what this encourages then is the artificial separation uh, between people uh, in this imagined realm of nature that didn't necessarily exist before. And this has to be done in a very particular way. Right? So often for local people living in rural areas, right, they have a direct relationship with the resources around them, right, direct interaction with them, and they transform them in ways um, that are conducive to them being able to develop a livelihood, you know, through um, agriculture, right? Mm. And for many people then, you know, what they're interested in is not this kind of unruly realm of nature that ecotourists are looking for, but more of kind of like a rural landscape uh, that's been shaped uh, in such a way that it allows for people to, to live within it. But that's not usually what ecotourists are looking for. And so often you have a mismatch between the kind of landscapes that are valued by local people living in rural spaces and the ecotourists who come to visit. And that can mean that if all they see is those uh, spaces, ecotourists aren't interested in visiting these spaces. So what I found in a lot of my research is that um, ecotourism operations that, that were created directly by local people without a lot of input from foreigners 
were developed according to their own aesthetic, their own sense of what uh, tourists would want to see, often focused on kind of rural livelihood activities. And this didn't always jive well with the tourists who came and wanted to escape everything people were doing and getting into the realm of nature. And so this meant the people who tended to profit best from ecotourism were other former ecotourists themselves who'd come in with that same type of idea and were able to create operations and spaces that conform more with the ecotourist ideal. And so what this did in places like Costa Rica was kind of disadvantage local people in developing ecotourism because most of the ecotourism market came to be dominated uh, by foreigners uh, who moved in, bought up land, and developed operations that were more successful. Wow. Wow. And, you know, briefly, I guess, where do you think this comes from, this notion that Western and modern people have a desire to not only understand nature as being separate from the human realm, but especially wanting to experience it as separate? I think I, I know exactly where you're getting at. Yeah, in my analysis, you know, spent a lot of time thinking about this. And I think this is one of the things that's very important for travelers uh, to reflect on, right? What is this need a lot of people have to try to escape other people into this other realm? And I think where it comes from is this, right? Uh, to become modern in the sense, to develop this kind of modern way of acting in the world, there's a sense of what we need to do is kind of suppress our inner nature, right? Which we think of as being this kind of carefree animal, that just wants to indulge in the moment, indulge in pleasure. We need to suppress that to develop these qualities of discipline and deferral of, of gratification that we need in order to be able to succeed and progress within uh, modern civilization. Okay, And so the consequence of that is a sense of repression um, and stifling of this inner nature, which we see as necessary in order to be able to survive in, in society and being around other people. And then the only way to escape that is to then move into a realm where there's no people around. So when you get away from people, then you can get rid of the sense of constraint uh, and you can feel free in a way that we sense at least that modern society doesn't allow us to. Right? I don't think that's necessarily true. I don't think that, you know, we're really structured in, in the same sort of way that our animality compels us to indulgence, right? And pleasure. Mm -hmm. And it's only through socialization that we um, suppress uh, and constrain that. Uh, but that's kind of the story we tell about ourselves. And as long as we keep telling that story about ourselves and we'll always feel uh, suppressed within society and feel this need to escape uh, in, into wilderness. Wow. Yeah. I think the history of private property in the West and, and really very recently in the last 200 years, the enclosure of, of the commons throughout the world perhaps has, has something to say about that as well. Definitely. It wasn't it... Um, Rousseau, who said that the smartest thing that somebody ever did was to put a fence around a piece of property and tell other people it was uh, theirs and get them to believe in it. Or yeah, was it a Polanyi you know, who made a similar uh, statement that, yeah, that enclosing nature in this way was one of the strangest things that humans uh, had ever done, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so really then putting the sense that we have that you know private property is just this natural institution in the historical perspective and realize from a, a larger perspective just how strange it is, right? Uh, to organize space in, in, in this way. Mm. I wanted to talk to you about the result or the consequence of this fencing in our interior lives and of our physical lives uh, in the context of catharsis in traveling and mm. addiction. So you write that the affective release offered in ecotourism is transitory. And hence, rather than delivering an enduring satisfaction of existential angst, the experience usually provides merely a pseudo catharsis that paradoxically leaves the subject or tourist even more dissatisfied through deprivation of the previous stimulation. Mm -hmm. Could you elaborate a little bit for us about this notion of pseudo catharsis? Because, you know, reading your essays, I see so much of my previous traveling addiction as pseudo catharsis. Could you unpack this a little bit for our, for our listeners? I think, again, it comes back to the basic motivation for traveling, right? Much of the time we feel that there's something lacking in our uh, everyday lives uh, that we um, then want to try to find uh, through escaping that uh, in the form of uh, travel. But of course, in the end, unless we permanently leave and go somewhere else uh, and create a new life, we end up coming back to the same types of things. Mm -hmm. So the escape that we get can only really be uh, a temporary. 
And even if we do leave a previous life behind and establish a new life somewhere else, uh, then that changes our relationship with the place. Because right? uh, the way we talk about it, the experience that you get uh, in traveling and in other kind of forms of rituals is a state that we call liminality, right? Where you leave structures behind and you experience this kind of sense of freedom. But that can only really be ever transitory because it only exists uh, in between different structures. And so if you then leave a structure behind and go to a different place, then over time, you'll create a new structure around that. And that state of liminality that you originally experienced will disappear. And so this is why oftentimes, you know, when you go to a place, you feel the sense of freedom, of peace and calm, and think that it's the place itself that's causing that. And therefore, wouldn't it be nice to, to move to this place and establish yourself there? And then you can feel this way all the time, right? Rather than recognizing that it's the way you're experiencing the place as opposed to the place itself that's responsible for that feeling. And it can over really, only ever really be transitory if the way you're uh, experiencing that is through escaping uh, structures, right? And there's also the fact that, yeah, the experiences that you have during these travels, it's about finding new spaces, having new experiences, all of these things kind of fade over time, right? And so the initial kind of rush that you get, the initial sensation has to diminish, right? As you become accustomed to uh, a place and experience. And that means that uh, the only way to uh, recapture that experience is to go somewhere else to find something new, right? And over time, you know, as you accumulate more of these experiences, then any new experience no longer has that same kind of impact because you've seen so much of it before. And so what you can do then is try and is keep chasing new and more extreme experiences over time, but, but that eventually uh, has some kind of limit. Okay? And so essentially it comes back to that basic idea. If the reason why you're traveling is to escape some essential dissatisfaction, then you're never really going to be able to do so because that dissatisfaction comes from yourself. The antidote to that is to try to examine that source of dissatisfaction and to think about how it is you can structure your everyday life in such a way that it actually is more satisfying and you don't feel a need to escape it. And then your travels can be more of a kind of like an icing on the cake, something that you do in addition to increase the satisfaction you feel through your life, as opposed to trying to find the satisfaction somewhere else that you don't experience in your, in your everyday world. Wow. Yeah, I think, you know, this is you just described basically the entire decade of my 20s <laughs> in a minute there. That was it. You know, I got my first whiff of it and then I, I kept going and wanting more. And then over the years, the, the trips got longer and eventually I needed to learn on my travels. And there was a sense of needing to deepen and not just broaden the experiences but every time I came back, there was always this sense of what most people call or what's often referred to as re reverse culture shock. Oh, yes. Right? But I think it was more of a sense of not that, that I had become temporarily estranged from the place I had come from by returning and by leaving over and over again. It's also something that some people refer to as destination addiction. And it's incredible how some of these things get glorified in social media circles, because, you know, if you've ever been addicted to a real substance or, or have ever had a, a, a difficult addiction to deal with, you know that, that the patterns are the same across the board. And to deal with them, to analyze what makes you dissatisfied in the world is really the only way to deal with these things, as opposed to holding them up on a throne and glorifying them. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's interesting. Uh, you know, we talk about addiction. There's a substances in a very negative sense, right? But being an adrenaline junkie right, mm. is something that's heroized. And my equivalent of what you're talking about was doing extreme sports. Mm -hmm. I got really into whitewater kayaking. And I found over time that the experiences that had provided me with stimulation before would no longer do so. And I had to keep looking for uh, more difficult and more risky forms of excitement. Uh, and what this does is just escalate. And I got to the point where I realized that only way I could actually enjoy these activities anymore was by doing things that could potentially kill me. Wow. All right. um, wow. You know, and essentially then there's no end to this other than, you know, potentially death. And that's exactly what happens to a lot of uh, extreme sports uh, enthusiasts, right? Is they can't stop. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and eventually die. Some people are able to escape this, but, but it does happen. Uh, so there are, you know, potentially significant consequences to this. And for me, I realized at a certain point that I didn't want to die doing these things. 
And as a result, I would have to actually start um, asking myself seriously um, why I was doing these things uh, and try to come to a different relationship with my uh, regular life uh, that didn't force me to try to escape it in pursuit of extreme thrills. Wow. Wow. Well, which is still an ongoing process <laughs> <laughs> of coming to terms with the mundane every day. <clears throat> yeah. Well, I, you know, at no point following or during our, our relative addictions do we actually uh, manage to escape the circumstances that lead us to them, if, if anything, mitigate or heal, but not escape necessarily. Mm-hmm. And so I wanted to ask you a question about the body in the context of ecotourism, right? You write that in short, however subtly, the orchestration of ecotourist experiences amounts to a disciplining of the body whereby ecotourist bodies become sites of capitalist accumulation and tourists become participants in the ongoing co-optation of socio-natures within a neoliberal mode of capitalist conservation. There's a whole lot there. Do you think you could uh, elaborate a little bit for our listeners? Yeah, so one of the interesting ways that capitalism works is actually by going to work on our bodies uh, and transforming them in particular ways. For instance, when we hire a a personal trainer, right, uh, to sculpt ourselves in particular ways, or when we hire a nutritionist to give ourselves uh, a certain eating regimen. And one of the kind of paradoxical things that happens as a result of that, especially within kind of a contemporary neoliberal climate, a free market climate, is that capitalism kind of compels us to do opposite things at the same time, right? So there's a whole industry that's devoted to creating advertising uh, to get us to eat more, right? To get us to eat as much as possible. And of course, the logical consequence of that for many people is getting overweight and having a health impact. And then kicks in another capitalist industry that's designed to help us manage and, and lose that weight, right? So one form of capitalism kind of compels us to overconsume, and then another form of capitalism compels us to address the impacts of that consumption, right? People travel because they're stressed out um, and dissatisfied with their lives working in mainstream uh, capitalist society, right? And they want to get out of that. They want to find a different space where they can uh, move their body in different ways, where they can experience uh, different kinds of emotions. And ecotourism essentially sells that, right? So essentially at its essence, what ecotourism is selling uh, is a particular bodily experience, okay? and it's what we call flow and transcendence. It's when you become so absorbed in the present moment that you lose a sense of the passage of time, of yourself as distinct from the surrounding environment. You feel this sense of kind of uh, connection with the larger world and a sense of kind of peace and, and satisfaction and enjoyment. At its essence, that's what ecotourism, like many forms of tourism, uh, tries to, to sell you. And so what it's doing is capitalizing on a particular bodily experience as the basis for value creation. Wow. Thank you, Robert. Uh, so we've been speaking quite a bit uh, today about the consequences of, of ecotourism and capitalism specifically. I'd like to turn the page and see if we might speak about post-capitalism and the the dreams that might help usher in uh, a different kind of world and a different kind of way of living that isn't necessarily escapist. And so you write that to realize its post-capitalist potential, tourism must move radically from a private and privatizing activity to one founded in and contributing to the common or the commons. Given the diverse forms of ecotourism projects that you studied, do you think that's possible? I do think it's possible, uh, but that it's quite difficult because we all live within an overarching capitalist society and world. And those are kind of the the default institutions that we grapple with, right? Default processes that we're immersed in. Uh, So trying to create, you know, post-capitalist spaces, spaces that operate according to different logic is quite difficult, but not impossible. Mm -hmm. But it also depends on how you think about capitalism. If you think about it as one coherent global system, then it becomes uh, more difficult to envision alternatives, right? Because creating those alternatives would mean transforming the system as a whole. But if you think of capitalism more specifically as a particular type of production and exchange, then you get a bit more nuance, 
Okay? So the way we think about capitalism is basically the production of value through employing wage labor, right? through employing other people to work for you, and then appropriating the difference between the value they create and what you pay them. And that becomes the basis for accumulating capital. And then the aim of capitalism becomes to try to use that process as a basis to accumulate as much capital as possible. Okay? I suppose capitalism from that perspective means operating according to different logic, right? Not paying people less than the value that's created and not then using that as a basis uh, to appropriate resources privately. And so if you, you know, look at things from that perspective, then it's possible to find lots of examples of post-capitalism in practice and to imagine ways of, of pushing that further, right? Where you have common ownership of reserves, where you have production within that, where the value is appropriated by everybody as opposed to particular individuals. And hence, there isn't really a difference between the value that people create and the value that they receive because everybody shares uh, equally uh, in that value. And so if you have production and exchange, then based on this kind of anti-profit motive uh, principle where resources are created and managed through collective decision-making and where the value that's produced is collectively owned and distributed, and then, you know, by definition, you're already starting to talk about post-capitalist practices. And you can see quite a few examples of these in some types of community-based ecotourism operations that do exist in, in lots of places around the world. What do you think have been the most compelling or jarring aspects of those, of those projects? What, what's really stood out for you in that regard? Well, I mean, I've seen some really inspiring examples uh, of this where, you know, groups of where communities in, in rural spaces, Costa Rica is where I have most of my examples from, uh, have come together, you know, largely of their own initiative, sometimes with the support from outsiders to try to figure out how to integrate tourism uh, into their collective management of these resources, right? And to do it in a, such a way where it's developed uh, communally and where, you know, the benefits that are provided by tourism then are reintegrated uh, into a larger community uh, development strategy, right? And I think those aspects are really important. On the other hand, it's very challenging to do so. And that's what I've really been struck by as well, uh, is how much of a struggle it is uh, to do this uh, and to do it well, because it takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of uh, conscious uh, work uh, to make sure that you're being as inclusive as possible and that you're not perpetuating forms of exclusion, along lines of gender uh, in particular, that you're not excluding members of the community, all right? But that also you're not then allowing people to, you know, simply benefit from other people in the community's work when they're not contributing to it as well, all right? So actually developing genuine mechanisms for uh, participation and for democratic decision-making throughout a community and then benefit sharing that's equitable is a significant challenge for any community. Mm, yeah. My my personal doubts around this stem from the notion that when travel happens, we're we're always talking about the the meeting of different worlds and in the human context of different cultures. You know, I wonder about ecotourism projects and the ones that I've seen here in Oaxaca and southern Mexico that have been very successful in ensuring that the, the basis for community structures and community integrity and livelihood stays intact and the projects themselves aren't based around the, the, the need fulfillment or desires of foreign people, what you would hope for would be some kind of achieved cross-cultural learning, right? That would create or deepen a kind of local hospitality on both sides. But what we've seen recently, you know, with COVID is that the expectation and entitlement, both of foreigners and of local people when it comes to capitalist modes of production and wealth creation, that infection is what we see, right? Both in the sense of biological viruses and, and secondly, in the sense of the inundation of modernity and a modern mindset. And so, I mean, those are my doubts, right? But I wonder, do you think it's possible to avoid those things? without turning the stranger away or turning the foreigner away? Do people just have to gamble and hope that such dreaming can happen amongst people from different cultures in, in, in this day? Mm -hmm. 
And I think the ideal that you're talking about, you know, is possible to achieve, but that it is quite difficult, right? On the one hand, I always uh, keep in mind the saying that I think is interesting, uh, that the perfect is the enemy of the good, right? And, mm. you know, it's difficult to achieve any ideal. On the other hand, uh, you don't want to compromise uh, your values too much. But in the end, from a more realistic perspective, I mean, we all live within this uh, capitalist uh, world and society. And so the alternatives in terms of you know, what we can do in order to sustain our livelihood, many of them are not that good. Right? And so tourism can, um, you know, if approached in the right way, be preferable to many other things like working in a maquiladora or exploiting your, your resources, allowing a mining company to come in and, and mine your territory. Right. So if you have a range of alternatives, none of which are, are that good, uh, then tourism could potentially be a, a, a least uh, worst option for some communities. But there are distinct dangers in using it. And I think the, the best way to mitigate these is for communities to, to be very conscious about the process that they're engaged in, to be aware of all of the, the pitfalls that we know about very much from previous research research that's been done about tourism development and to proactively prepare for these kind of things and to try to mitigate them. Right? Yeah. And that will mean that you're going to be focusing your operation on particular types of tourists, those who are willing to kind of move beyond just trying to consume a pleasurable experience and actually think about travel as a form of mutual exchange that isn't necessarily about their pleasure, but is, is more about this uh, cultural exchange and, you know, and consciously, you know, using their movement uh, and their privilege as a basis to, to help kind of distribute uh, resources in a different way. But inherently, this comes with uh, various power imbalances, right? You have the fact that tourists are the ones leaving home and going to other places. Uh, they, they leave at the end of it, but local people have to stay there. Tourists are bringing almost by definition more money than local people have, which creates its own own imbalance, right? And so those are all dangers in terms of then, you know, even if uh, not consciously, uh, kind of implicitly asking the local people to change themselves and their behavior to accommodate uh, tourists. But being aware of uh, those dynamics, I think, uh, can help to, to mitigate those. And then I think it's a matter of attracting then and informing tourists the right type of tourists about the type of activities that they're going to experience uh, and what they're not going to get uh, is just a bunch of people catering uh, to their whims. And they can't expect that mm. if they actually want to be responsible tourists in the way that many of them claim. Which means in a sense that tourism becomes something different or travel becomes something different than the way many have imagined it and what we've gone in search of. But then hopefully it becomes closer to the ethics that we claim we want to practice in our travel, uh, but often fall for, short of actually doing. Right. Yeah. The, the other day I was interviewing the communications campaigner from uh, the Stay Grounded organization, which you probably know about. Oh, yes. It's mm -hmm. yeah. an organization in Europe that is fighting against climate change through aviation, fighting against aviation and the aviation mm -hmm. industry because of its effects on climate change. And, uh, you know, it made me consider this possibility. Well, what if in a post-capitalist world, we um, only had the opportunity to travel once or twice in our entire lives, right? And then, and what then would travel look like? And how would we proceed in our lives in the context of that travel, knowing that it, it, it will be the, the only time or the last time? And this is also in the context of the fact that the vast majority of people in the world don't have vacations that many people don't understand, cannot comprehend what leisure time is because it's so much uh, a stranger to their culture or to their traditions, right? This notion of going somewhere else and escaping for a few days or a week. And so that was a little bit of my dreaming in regards to that. What would a world look like if you could only travel once in your lifetime or, or twice maybe, mm -hmm. right? I think that's a really interesting thing to consider. And the first thing I would say to that is I don't think it's so hard to imagine mm. uh, for, for most people around the world because right. that is, in fact, their lives, right? It's a very small portion of the population that actually has the ability, has the luxury uh, to travel more than that. And so that actually is the reality for most people is a lack of mobility, a lack of ability to travel around when they want to and probably will only take one or two significant trips in their lifetime, if at all, right? Mm. And so though for the tiny majority of us that actually have created these lifestyles around and a perpetual movement, I think it is inevitable as we move forward and if we get serious about addressing climate change and other issues that we will have to very much confront that and are likely moving into a future where long-scale travel 
will become very much a rare occurrence as opposed to the, the norm uh, that has become uh, for that small group of people. It'll be a big shift, right? And for those of us who've become, you know, very much attached to this form of mobility, and I include myself within that group, it'll be a very dramatic shift. Right? Mm-hmm. Maybe for um, children who grow up right, in this newer world, it won't be such a trip because they will live lives that they don't feel as much of a need to escape from, and much of a sense that this is kind of the norm and the way you should be, and their identities won't be attached to mobility uh, in that same way. But it will be a, quite a shift uh, for many of us, and it, it's quite daunting to consider. Mm, yeah. yeah. You mentioned the term that I think most people would agree with, uh, which is a lack of mobility, right? But how might we see that in a world where escapism isn't at the base or foundation of our desire to travel? You know, Might it be something more like a depth or a studiousness or apprenticing of home? Right. And that such a thing might be the great honor that we have or that future generations would have that that perhaps we didn't or we couldn't consider under the current circumstances. And so, you know, Frederick Jameson, the philosopher, famously wrote that it's easier for people to imagine the end of the world than, than the end of capitalism. Right. And so where do you think this relative poverty of imagination comes from? Right. You know, I mentioned something and you say, well, and you said, well, you know, it's, it's not too difficult to imagine. And as, as soon as you said that, I'm like, I thought, yeah, you're right. It's not, it's not that difficult to imagine. Right. But why do you think that it becomes so difficult for people to envision different worlds, new worlds? Mm-hmm. Well, in part, that's exactly how uh, ideology is intended to operate, right? Any dominant paradigm intends to try to present itself as natural, as inevitable, uh, and not contingent, right? Because that's how uh, it sustains itself. Uh, So capitalism as not just an economic uh, system, but as kind of a cultural paradigm, right? Works through uh, this form of naturalization of seeming like it's just the inevitable background to the world, as opposed to a system that was not necessarily uh, coherently, but to a certain extent, consciously and intentionally uh, created at a particular point in time. Right? And for a relatively small amount of time, if you think about this, the span of human history, we've had a capitalist system for maybe 500 or 600 years. It seems like a long time in terms of our own lifetime, but in the whole scheme of things, it's quite a short period of time. And it's very then possible to imagine that a thousand years in the future, people will look back at capitalism as a small blip and the evolution of a human society rather than this uh, kind of hegemonic and ingrained structure that, that we consider it uh, to be. Mm-hmm. So that's yeah, exactly how ideology works is by making it seem that it's impossible to imagine uh, things otherwise. And then of course, always the way to start breaking that down is to start seeing it in this long-term perspective, in this historical perspective, as a culturally specific kind of moment, as a contingent system that we've created and can potentially decide uh, to do otherwise, right? So that's the first step. And then actually taking steps to create structures, to create processes that escape capitalist logic to whatever degree is the next step. And probably the harder one, actually. Because, right? mm-hmm. uh, well, it's easier to imagine anything you want. Actually making those changes usually puts you in opposition to entrenched interests and power relations. And if you push hard enough against those, then of course they start to push back. If you actually uh, create a credible threat, then you're going to experience some some resistance. Uh, and that can be a, a quite daunting to consider. And then to persevere when you encounter that resistance. Mm. Yeah, from my little experience and from what I've read in your work that you know seems to be a, a massive function of ecotourism, that there's this dreaming to push back against the conventional modes of tourism, but in the end, the, the fallout and the consequences is this blowback, right? It's- I mean, if you're trying to still work within uh, the dominant system, right, mm-hmm. then that system is going to end up uh, shaping what you produce uh, in ways that you didn't necessarily intend, right? Uh, that's kind of inevitable working within these structures Mm. and so consciously working to move yourself to uh, to agree from them while also recognizing that whatever you do is going to be uh, still shaped by these overarching content and is never going to be as as pure as you intend i think is uh, the only realistic uh, way forward yeah yeah i'm reminded of audrey lord's quote the master's tools cannot dismantle the master's house Mm. And so my last question for you, Robert, if I may, 
what are your dreams? What are your personal dreams for a post-capitalist world? What would that look like? Um, I would like to see a world in which we share the wealth that we have much more equitably. Mm. I mean, that for me is the, the essence of things, right? The fact that we really do have this incredible abundance and yet we have this uh, perception of scarcity because of the fact that wealth is distributed so unequally, right? So unequally. And that right now, the possibility of challenging that inequality and sharing that wealth then inspires such strong reactions. I was thinking about recently when you know, this really inspiring uh, congresswoman out from New York, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, uh, showed up to this uh, wealthy ball in New York wearing a dress that said tax the rich on the back, right? Taxing the rich, I think, you know, from a 20th century welfare state perspective, is not such a radical proposition, right? Isn't that what taxation is designed to do? Mm. But yet the fact that she wore this dress <laughs> really pissed off a tremendous amount of people, right? And that for me just shows how skewed things have become, right? Mm. This idea that somehow accumulation of, you know, obscene wealth is considered more palatable than questioning that, right? And that asking that things should be distributed more evenly. And I think I would love to see a world in which that changed, where accumulating wealth uh, in that way was considered immoral right, and obscene, mm. and where it was considered a norm that that kind of accumulation of wealth wouldn't be allowed. It would be considered as something that was asocial uh, as opposed to, to hero-wise. And of mm. course, that would mean that how we look at the world and how we operate in the world had changed dramatically. So a world in which distribution of wealth was considered the norm and accumulation was considered a, a horrific thing that we had a hard time accepting and contemplating would be the world that I would let, want to live in. Mm. Well, I'd be knocking on that door. First <laughs> chance I get. Wow, that's beautiful. Thank you, Robert. So this brings us, I think, to the end of our time together. How might our listeners find your work? Well, you can find everything that I've published uh, on my own uh, personal website, www.anthfletch.com. Uh, my background is in cultural anthropology. My last name is Fletcher. You can uh, email me directly, and I'll pass on anything uh, that you would want to find. I can also direct you to a lot of other uh, work that has inspired me and my own thoughts on this. And so that's the main suggestion I'd have for anybody is there's a lot out there, a lot of resources. And if you're really interested in thinking about the motivation for and the impacts of your travel, then you can find all the things that you need uh, to really reflect on all of that and to use that as the basis to think about how travel better and with better consequences uh, in the future. Mm. Amen. Well, make sure that those links uh, to your work, Robert, are up on the End of Tourism website as well. So I, I really, really appreciate your time and what you've been willing to share with us today, Robert. It's really a great honor, to be honest. Well, thank you so much, Robert. I'm just, you know, so thankful for your work. And it's really opened my eyes to a lot of a lot of what, you know, was missing, I think, previously. So thank you. Thanks a lot for, uh, yeah, uh, developing this discussion. Mm -hmm. Sounds like it's a lot of work on your part. I hope uh, yeah, you're able to get enough out of it to, uh, to support that. It sounds like a tremendous amount of effort. Oh, yeah. Little by little. I wish you a, a wonderful night. And yeah, thanks again. Have a good day. Good luck with it all. Thanks, Rob. Thanks for reaching out. Take care. Thank you for listening to this episode of the End of Tourism podcast. If what you heard had its way with you, if the arrows hit their mark, click subscribe on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you're listening. To go deeper, join us at theendoftourism.com and follow us on social media under the handle The End of Tourism. Until then, farewell, friends.